It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 165, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Olivia Hubert farms with her husband, Greg Willer, at Brother Nature Produce in Detroit, Michigan, as well as at a farm an hour north of the city. Specializing in salad mix and fresh herbs sold to farmers markets, grocers, and restaurants, Brother Nature provides a living for both Greg and Olivia. Olivia grew up in Detroit, where she fell in love with agriculture as a high school student, and after studying at the Royal Horticulture Society of London, Olivia returned to Detroit, where she met Greg and joined him on his upstart urban farm. Olivia shares her experience farming with both sides of Detroit's environment, where gunshots and extreme poverty are never far from health nuts and concentrated wealth. She digs into what she learned about urban gardening from World War II gardening ethos in England, how they've learned to manage flea beetles, and how she and Greg grow fresh salad greens in the city without active refrigeration. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. Farmersweb.com and by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com and by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Olivia Hubert, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hello. Good to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for making time to join us today. Olivia, I'd like to start off by having you give us the lay of the land there at Brother Nature Produce, where you guys are located, how much farming you're doing, what kinds of crops you're growing, where you're selling them. So we started out, my husband and I, Greg, started out with a farm in the city of Detroit. We are in North Court Town. From here, you can see the train station. You can see the lights from the new hockey stadium and whatever other stadiums they put down there, the football stadium, the basket, the baseball, whatever. So we're right um, on the edge of downtown, and we have a one-acre farm here, and we specialize in salad mix. So... Getting land in the city, getting land so close to downtown has been difficult for us. So we were able to purchase some of the lots that we were farming. And in the meantime, we decided to buy some land in the country. Our farm in the country is in a little teeny tiny town in Riley, Michigan. And up there, we are slowly, very slowly developing it because it's 6.9 acres. So that's a big jump from one acre all the way up to six acres. So up there right now, we just have salad up there too. And where do we sell? Yeah, we specialize in salad mix. Where do we sell to? We sell to lots of different places. The biggest place we sell at is the Eastern Market. Eastern Market is maybe the oldest continuously running farmer market produce terminal in America. So they get last estimates I remember they were getting upwards of 40,000 people on a Saturday. So that's a big lot of farmers there. Every stall filled up thousands and thousands of people. So that's where we sell most of our salad mix. We also do herbs there and we do other seasonal things like we do those walking onions, Egyptian walking onions um, when they come up seasonally because they're an easy thing that we have already and they don't need as much attention as a salad is very needy. But based on square footage, you make the most money off of salad compared to any other crop, unless you're really intense about the thin farming and the and the rotations and stuff like that. So so that's why we choose salad. And also because my husband's hyper. <laughs> so he likes the salad because the salad, unlike other crops, is very needy. Like tomatoes, yeah, you have to pinch them and stuff like that, but you plant them. They're not as needy as the salad. The salad, you know, we do salad all season long. So... Every week we're ripping out seven rows and replanting. So he likes that because it keeps him busy and we, we make lots of compost. So he likes that too. He's always out there on the tractor, you know, that tractor love. Yep. <laughs> I, said, I said, don't let me stand. I said, let me get out of the way of this tractor because he's going to knock me down to get to this tractor and turn this compost. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder how I look at the tractor and I think, does he love you more than he loves me? 
<laughs> I mean, it is a tractor, uh, Olivia. It's a tractor. I know. I, I can't quite compare to the tractor. I can't lift things that heavy, although he does always tell people that I'm strong like bull. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, that's a joke about how I can pick up the other end of something heavy. He's strong like bull. So we also sell to restaurants. We try to sell to restaurants that are in a three mile radius of the farm because part of our marketing is to have salad that's less than 12 hours old. So we like to harvest the salad. We don't do refrigeration. Like um, most, I think most other farmers do some type of refrigeration, cool bot. We just we try to harvest it and then get it to the market. That's one of the benefits of being in the city of having an urban farm is you are, you are so close to markets and restaurants. And a lot of times restaurants don't have that much space to store produce. So they're calling and you can't just drop a delivery once a week. They need sometimes three deliveries a week. And you find yourself being very tied to the restaurants and constantly having to stop what you're doing otherwise, unless you're so close. But for us, we, you know, it's not that much of an inconvenience because we are so close anyway. And it's right in the neighborhood. I mean, and a lot of the people who own these restaurants are, are our neighbors too. So sometimes on their way to work, they'll stop by. So it's, it's all very nice and convenient. So we sell to about my husband said 13 restaurants, but there's seven restaurants that we were supplying pretty much their full demand of salad this past growing season. Like uh, we sell the Chapinos and Craftwork and Lady of the House is um, a new restaurant that everybody loves and that's busy. We also sell to a small local grocery store, The Farmer's Hand, and they've just expanded to add a, a, a cafe section. And we sell to Brooklyn Street Local. That's another local favorite people. People love that place. So we sell to restaurants. We also sell to people who are doing private catering. There's a big thing in Detroit for people wanting to take control of their health. And I, I'm sure people have heard the, you know, the horrible statistics about how unhealthy people are in Michigan and Detroit, especially. But people are really trying to, to change that. So there's a lot of people becoming vegetarians and vegans. And so they are, uh, some people are obsessed with the salad. I remember a couple of years ago was a drought and we just didn't have that much salad and we had to pull back from the market. And some of our customers came to our house looking for us to make sure we are okay. They're like, we <laughs> haven't seen you. Where is the salad? It's like, okay, you're fine. Give me some salad. Because sometimes even when it's a drought, we don't have enough salad to come to the market, but we always have some salad. So the real diehard fans come to the farm. <laughs> they go directly to the source. They know how to find you. Yes. That's, I think that's kind of, that's part of some people's healthy living routine on Fridays. They'll ride their bikes around and, and see us harvest and then they'll buy salad from us on, on Saturdays at the Easter market. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Are you guys selling to Whole Foods? Because I know Whole Foods recently opened up a store in downtown Detroit and that was supposed to be this whole, oh, yeah. you know, urban renewal, Detroit's back on the map kind of a thing. Have you guys dipped into that marketplace as well? No, we we don't sell to we don't sell to Whole Foods because honestly we don't want to be a slave to the to that corporation. My husband used to be a teacher, and I am a you know a horticulturalist, and I used to work for the city of Detroit, and we want to be our own boss. We <laughs> these contracts that people get with Walmart and Meyer and even Whole Foods, uh, uh, uh-uh. uh. We like to be lean and mean and flexible and be able to do whatever we need to do and make changes. And, you know, even though a lot of people in Detroit love that Whole Foods and they stay up in there, I mean, it's like it's a party going on in there. People are coming in and out of there like, uh, what was that movie, The Naked Gun and The, the Wicker, The 24-Hour Wicker Shop? <laughs> My husband, you know, you okay, good. You I, know I don't, I I don't know. I'm actually laughing because you're making okay. a movie reference and, and, and my wife <laughs> watches a lot of movies and her question is always, well, have you seen? And then her answer is always like, of course not. Oh, I like your wife, man. Because I'm always <laughs> talking about, you remember that movie and people look at you like, what? I was like, come on, all this TV and movies people are watching, you don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's, it's the one with the, it's like Naked Gun or one of those. Yeah, there's a 24 hour wicker shop and people are. You can find clips on YouTube. We're running in and out of there constantly. Like, oh my God, I got to get in here. We were asked, we were approached by somebody who worked at Whole Foods before they opened, but we prefer, we prefer to do our own thing. 
And when you talk about a farmer's market that's getting 40,000 people through there on a Saturday, and talk about all these restaurants and, and grocery stores, and, and now this Whole Foods, it, it, it kind of runs in the face of, of the narrative that I hear about Detroit. And I don't know anything about Detroit personally. I, I fly through there all the time, but I've never actually left the airport. But, you know, what you hear about Detroit are things like post-apocalyptic and, and war zone. And that doesn't sound like that's your experience there. You know, I grew up in Detroit and Detroit is Detroit is weird because it is like that. Like everything that people I always tell people, everything that you heard about Detroit is true. And then some. So on the one hand, yeah, you'll have people riding their bikes past and, you know, they're going to be healthy now and they want to stop and buy some salad. And then on the next block away, you will hear gunshots. It's like, hmm, should we go in the house now? Well, they weren't that close. We'll stay outside. So it, it is, it's both those things. It's weird. And it clashes all the time. It clashes all the time. It's the people wearing, you know, $5,000 Shinola watch stepping over the homeless guy downtown who, you know, who might not make it to this next blizzard because there's not enough shelters. And you know what I'm saying? It's, it's happening. It's all happening at the same time. It's changing, but some things never change. It's, it's strange. You said you grew up in Detroit. Is that how mm-hmm. you ended up farming there? Yeah, back back in the day before the, the, edu- the education system took a nose, di- a nose dive. They there was a they had vocational school. They had several vocational schools in Detroit, and one of them had agri-science. And the classes were on Belau. You would you know, go to Belau, get bus to Belau, and uh, there's greenhouses. The Belau Conservatory has some service greenhouses, and the classroom, the Go Lightly agri-science class, had a little building out there, and we did floor design and we did SSA. Uh, competitions and you know all that all that kind of stuff we had a we would grow plants for a plant sale we would start the seeds we would do poinsettias for a plant so we would do all kinds of stuff so that's that's one of the ways that I got my start but even before that I was mentored by a retired biology teacher who lived in my neighborhood and you know I helped her in her garden and she, she taught me about stuff so so, like I said before, Detroit's one of those strange places. Like, if you want to get into trouble, like, several blocks away, those kids, you know, getting into trouble, carjacking, all the crazy stuff you hear about. Yeah, but then a few blocks away, I'm sitting in this max backyard drinking tea and talking about cell walls and stomatas. I'm glad there's a place to talk about cell walls and stomatas. <laughs> yeah. You got some training in horticulture in Detroit, and then you left in and spent some time at the Royal Horticulture Society of London managing gardens over there, right? Yeah, that was wonderful. That was a wonderful opportunity I got, actually because of the dreaded affirmative action. Oh, no, the five Black people are going to leave the hood. No, don't let them go. Um, But I went to Michigan State. I got a scholarship because there's so few minorities in agriculture. I majored. I have a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture. That's under the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. I got scholarships because of that. And I did well in horticulture, of course, because the stereotype about the overachieving black woman is true. (laughs) (laughs) And I took some of that money to go on a study abroad to the UK because I knew that if I went to the UK, I would learn a system of growing plants that was almost full safe. Back during the war, which if you ever have gardened in the UK, you'll hear people during the war, they still talk about that, even though those generations, I think they're pretty much all passed away now, but they had to feed themselves. They didn't have a choice. So they developed a way of growing food and growing plants that if you do this method, you won't starve. The plant will grow. So that's why I wanted to go there and see for myself. And when I went there, we went to... Wisley Gardens, the flagship garden of the Royal Horticulture Society, and we actually tracked down one of their trainees, horticultural trainees, because they get lots of visitors there. They'll get 7,000 visitors on a weekend or a Saturday or something. So to get work done, sometimes people will hide from the visitors. 
they just kind of dip around the bushes because if you talk to every single person who asks you a question, you can't get your work done and they're very serious about horticulture at the RHS. So when I learned that they had a trainee program, I said, okay, I'm going to do this when I when I graduate from Michigan State. And that's what I did. And I stayed there for a year. We had some wonderful experiences. We had a work weekend at Great Dixter. When I say that people, people are like, why is this woman saying this vulgar stuff? I'm like, no, Great Dixter, British words. It's an X, not it's Okay. People, people think they're funny. But yeah, Great Dixter Gardens. And he got to stay in the manor house overnight. And so that was, and, and learn about that sort of thing. So I did a, another special weekend there just on my own. Just, you know, because other people are interested in Detroit too. And Fergus Garrett, the, the head gardener there, he liked Detroit <laughs> for some reason. And so they were, they were excited to be somebody from, from Detroit. So I came back for another weekend while I was still living in the UK and learned about topiaries, how they make the squirrel shapes and the pigeon shapes and the peacock and all this other stuff like that. So I had to go back home eventually. I didn't, but I thought I did. I felt hmm, I should you know, go back home and get a job after, you know, 16, 17 years, pretty much of going to school full time. You get sick of, of just learning things and talking about well, what you're going to do when you get finished learning things. So I was ready for my life to start. But I came back in, to America in 2009, and that's when the stock market crashed. And I could not find a job, of course. And it had become a you're overqualified situation. Like, wow, your resume, wow, but we don't have a job for you. But that was okay because I had worked um, doing private landscaping since I was 14 years old. So I just picked that back up until I was able to get a job at the city of Detroit, which also was a mess at the time. So eventually I just realized, you know, I met my husband and like, we just need to do our own thing and be our own boss because we're very solution oriented people. And when you work for other people, there are solutions to problems. There's always solutions, but are you able to implement them? Are you able to implement them fully and effectively? And so that can only really happen when you are self-employed. You talk about this wartime gardening style in England. What's the core of that? Mm -hmm. What did you learn about growing things when you don't have any resources? It's an extreme attention to detail. I mean, these people were still gardening and button-up shirts, ties, and that. They were serious. You can't leave things to chance, attention to details. We would have test uh, practicums, they call them, where you would be given seeds or cut, you were, you know, cuttings, and you would have to take the cuttings and put them in the flat, and they would, and the judges would come around, and they would rip all the cuttings out, and they would poke their fingers into the corners of the flats and make sure that you fill the tray of proper. There was a proper way to do everything. There's a proper way to fill a tray, to take a cutting, to water the tray afterwards. It's all about attention to detail. You can't just throw seeds out and, and some of them might grow. Some of them, won't, you know, obviously a lot of them won't grow. Birds will get them. They'll dry out. The wind will blow them around. They'll fall between the cracks of the soil. It's got to be attention to detail. There's even a proper way to hold a rake. A hard rake if you're going to rake the soil to a fine tilt based on the size of the seeds. So lots of attention to detail. And is that something that you brought to Brother Nature Produce when you came back and started farming there? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a joke. I, me and my husband say we're gonna in the wintertime do a, a a farmer husband and wife comedy team and go around because when I met him, he was still teaching and he was just throwing seeds out on top of the ground. He wasn't covering them up. He wasn't putting compost on top of them. He wasn't watering them in right after he covered them up. He was just, and, and stuff was growing. He's one of those lucky people. So he didn't think anything of it. But I'm like, what are you doing? So yeah, we got him on the right track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've been farming there since 2009. How long was Greg farming at that spot before you came along? He started in the backyard growing stuff in 2006. And you guys are making a living at Brother Nature Produce, right? Yeah, we're making a living, but we have 
wisely, and I would recommend, and I've heard other farmers mention it kind of, sort of, but then there's pushback against it. Yes, diversify your income. We diversified our income because even though, you know, you can do salad really successfully quite easily in the spring and in the fall and the summer, and sometimes if there's a really harsh winter like this one we just had, even in the hoop houses, salad didn't make it or in our case, when we got that foot of snow and then it started raining afterwards, our hoop house, the snow was melting but didn't melt off fast enough, collapsed our hoop house, so we had to take it apart and fix it. So the salad that was in there, you know, didn't make it. We diversify our income. So the, one of the first things we did was we started doing for higher work. So one of the benefits also being in the city is people are fixing up their houses and they're fixing up their lots and stuff. So simple stuff with a tractor, like putting in fence posts, you know, with the post hole digger attachment and leveling the soil with the bucket. My husband is really good with maneuvering the tractor. <laughs> he says that he should have been an Air Force fighter every time he, because people watch him and he maneuvers and people like close their eyes. They're like, oh my God, he's about to crash into the side of my house. Oh my God, they can't watch. But he never does because he maneuvers and then he always smiles. He's got a dimple. And every time he smiles, it's like, ee! You know, it's like a star comes out of his dimple and like I was everybody with a starlight. And he's like, I should have been an airport, Air Force pilot. Um, so we so so that's that's the first thing we diversified in doing. And then we also we had now we have his and her chainsaws. So we'll do chainsawing work for people taking down small trees. Nothing, nothing big. We're not climbing up in the tree or any of that kind of stuff. Um, we do that stuff, and that's good for in the spring, in the fall, in the in between time. And then we also we had a big we we got a big ugly a big ugly truck. It's three colors. One time we came across some when when we were at the Eastern Market, the truck was parked in the vendor parking lot at the Eastern Market, and so a family of Russians because they were speaking Russian. We're all looking at taking pictures of the truck. I don't think they could believe that this truck was actually still working and functioning. But we're like, hey, so we decided to the truck is is like it is, but we could get some we could get some more use out of this truck and we attach a plow, a snow plow to the front of it and we plow snow in the wintertime because even though it hadn't been in in our part of the Great Lakes snowing that much this year, it snowed a lot. And it was snowing enough to be you know, to bring in some money because that's a lean time in the winter time for a lot of farmers that rely on their savings. And if you had a not so good year, then you could be in trouble. So yeah, we plow snow. We do the for higher work, the plowing, the tilling, the post holes. We do tree removal. And then we've also bought a second house. So he had the house. He owned it. House when we first met. We call it the White House because the house is white. <laughs> and then when the house next to us on the corner came up, it didn't come up for sale, but the woman who lived here, it was a family of hoarders. And the woman mother died and she didn't want to be in here by herself. So she left the house for a year. People were trying to break into the house and all kinds of stuff. And we're like, we can't have this. So we just talked to her and we said, look, you going to let this house just be here? Like, if she was a hoarder. You know how hoarders are. They are happy to have stuff and just not do anything with it. And their mind is theirs and they can do what they want with it. But yeah, I guess we needed the money. So we bought a second house, fixing that up. And so we're Airbnb the White House. And we hope to turn that into more of a, a place to experience urban farming and less just a cheap, clean, safe place to stay on your way from uh, to and from Canada or like, that's where most of our people come from. They're coming from, they're going to Toronto or, you know, they're traveling because we're, uh, you know, real close to Canada over here. In fact, we're a few blocks away from the Detroit River. And it's interesting that people, there, there's pushback from the city of Detroit against urban farming because they would rather have the highest use of the land and, you know, have it be, I guess, apartment buildings or something like that. And we laugh because the city, the population isn't even 700,000 anymore. And there's, you know, hundreds and there's thousands and thousands of vacant lots. And so 
you know, don't lose money in the meantime waiting for a meal ticket. That's like if you have debts to pay and you have things you're not using and you don't want to sell them because I can get a lot of money from them. Yeah, but you need money now. People want it now. But originally, all of this was farm. In fact, when we got the deed to the house that we're living in now and fixing up, it says uh, that it was parcel off from Thompson Farm. In other words, this was probably one of those ribbon farms that stretched from the river, a ribbon farm. You know about ribbon farm? No. Ah, ribbon farms. Some history. Uh, Greg was a, or he did a major in history, so he don't, don't get me started. You know, he's little through him, through him, through me lecture about the history of Detroit. But anyway, Detroit was always a place where people would come to trade. The native people would come and trade with the fur trappers, the French Canadian, before I guess they were Canadian, French fur trappers. And, but they worried, the farmers worried about being attacked by the native people. So they may, instead of having a bunch of wide farms, and there's other reasons too, but this is what's generally said. They made really long but narrow farms that way they would have enough farmland to be worth farming to be able to sustain themselves but then the farms would be close together that way if they needed help they wouldn't have to run across 20 acres to get help they could just run next door basically so this far this house i guess was probably it's probably one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood the first map of the city of detroit was made in 1885 when we went looking around downtown for stuff and paperwork God, paperwork. Our house was sitting here. There was nothing else. It was like this house and prairie, pretty much. So I'm saying all this to say that really us farming and other people farming in the city of Detroit is returning the land to what it was a long time ago. There were farms, people farming or hunting and trading along these streets that have been paved over and things. So people should be more accepting of it because that's what it well, that's what it always was, and obviously that's what that's what it's returned to again. So maybe we should just go with that. When you say that the city is wanting that land that you're using as farmland to go to you know, some other higher and best use, I mean, I'm seeing as I look at the map of Detroit, I'm seeing things like you know a couple of different casinos, and and you mentioned all of the sports stadiums and all of that, but yeah. which which to me, you know, as a farmer, doesn't really strike me as the highest and best use, but right. <laughs> has the city made it difficult for you guys to have an urban farm? Are there things that they do that stand in the way of your success there? Yeah, the city really doesn't have a policy around urban farming. Like people are urban farming and they're forging ahead because people in Detroit have been through a lot. And so growing food and and growing flowers and building community that way is what has kept Detroit alive is what has kept people going and kept people, you know, from just losing their minds and just, you know, just packing up and just, we're gone. I just can't take it anymore. So the city is, it, the city's having it, they're having it both ways. On the one hand, they don't have any policy about urban farming or to help you purchase land or giving any sort of priority around land. But then they, you know, <laughs> go to our, I guess, I guess we have sister cities in Europe. There's one in France and one in Italy. And talking about urban farming and how wonderful it is and stuff, even though you can't go to the city and say, you know, I would like to buy these lots of farm. They say, you hear all kinds of stuff. It's not that they come right out and say no. It's just that there is no way, there's no direct way for you to actually get the land specifically to farm. Because now there's another pseudo government entity, the land bank, that the city has so much land, it decided to turn land over to the land bank and let them be bothered with selling it or doing something with it, even though the city still pays independent contractors to maintain the lot. And when you're talking about wanting to farm pieces of land, it's my understanding that there's a lot of simply abandoned plots, abandoned parcels of land in Detroit. Yeah, our neighborhood, we always laugh because we have the same amount of neighbors in the city as we do out in the country. In the country, we can see six houses, and the houses are like a couple acres away. 
you know, they're within like hollering distance, like, hey, hey, you know, you can, you can see the person, you can't make out their face, but you can see, you know. And then here on the block we live on, we have, there's six houses on this block too. Wow. So it's like, hmm, it's very strange to be, you know, so close to downtown. And I just saw two big male pheasants run past. I guess they're about to start bickering over females at that time of year. We could be keeping us up at night, going back and forth, crowing or honking. It doesn't sound like crowing, but you know, yeah. you know, <laughs> the pheasants. <laughs> So, yeah, there's so much of it. And what I've always said, and I've, I've written about it on our website, com, is that there's plenty of, of land for everybody to have most of what they want, but it would just require people to be organized. It would require the, the city and land bank or whoever's in charge to be organized. And for whatever reason, I mean, it does benefit people to not have any hard and fast rules about things because then you can, you know, pick and choose who who gets to do what and when and where and how and stuff like that. But it just, it overall is not good for the city because it makes people not want to be bothered with the city. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you want to revitalize the city. You want businesses to come and people to come move here and have families and stuff like that. But nobody wants to move to some place where there's rules, but you don't find out what they are unless you break them or people opening businesses hire people to do the paperwork for them because it's so intense that they can't start a business on their own. They can't figure it out. They had to hire somebody to do the paperwork for them. And is that part of why you bought some land in the country as well as having the farm in the city? Yeah, that's exactly why. Cause, you know, he had left teaching and was full-time farming and I was still full-time working in the conservatory on Belle Isle. And I didn't want to full-time farm because I'm like, you know, this is, shaky situation we can't you know what if something happens or what and I said okay well let's let's buy some land in the country because then we can we can own something and we can just we can just take our bets now we're still we're in the process of trying to purchase more of the lots that we're farming from the land bank and we hope it goes well and we're getting letters of support from our our neighborhood association and the business association of the neighborhood and stuff like that so but yeah, it's, you know, I was, okay, farming in the, in the city has pretty much the only benefit of farming in the city is being close to your markets, being close to the people you sell to. Other than that, farming in the country is easier because you can have a huge compost pile and you don't have to worry about it offending anybody and there's more space to grow things. So it's easier to have a well-rounded farm. Like I feel like, especially for such a, a hungry crop like salad, you need you have to replenish the soil constantly with nutrients. And uh, the best way to do that is animals and animal manure and using animals to plow and till. And it's difficult in the city because you still have all the same predators for your animals as they do in the country. It's because there's coyotes in the city and there's foxes in the city and hawks and all this other stuff. Plus there's people's dogs, which are the worst because they have absolutely no fear of humans. And they're out all day and all night. And people are like, oh, my dog, I just let him off the leash for a second. It's like, your dog is a killer. And my chickens were just doing their thing. And and you're the one at fault, but my chickens are still dead. Buffy's still gone. Buffy! That was my favorite chicken. I even wrote a song about her. I won't sing it, but she had a song. <laughs> and what do you do when you're out there weeding the salad rolls? You make up songs about your favorite animals. I made up plenty of songs while I was riding on the tractor, but like you said, it's better not to sing them to other people if you if you wanted to keep listening to you. <laughs> so tell me about farming in the country because now you guys are managing two pieces of land that are <laughs> an hour apart, right? Right, right. They're an hour apart. But you know, it's a nice drive. When we were looking for land in the country, we looked up straight, like straight north, like Lapeer area, but that was a horrible drive. All the people who work downtown but live north of the city in the suburbs drive like they don't care if they get home dead or alive. So we're like, oh no, we can't do this stressful drive. But driving the other way along the Coast, I guess I feel funny saying it because it's a peninsula in the Great Lakes and not <laughs> not the ocean, not the you know East Coast or something. But the coast driving up the coast 
the thumb of Michigan is a nice drive. It's, it's not too, it's not too many cars. And it gives us a chance to really think and talk about stuff because it's hard husband and wife team to actually, and then we have a, a four-year-old to actually talk about anything, the farm, whatever. So it gives us a chance to talk and what went well, what didn't go so, uh, so well. And there's three ice cream shops along the way. So <laughs> that's another like, like, yeah, let's get out there. Then we'll get some ice cream. Yeah. But the farm in the country is, it's in a low spot. You could see there's a creek that runs through it. You can see clearly the contours of it sloping down to the creek. But, and some people would say that this is a disadvantage because of the wetness and the heavy clay soil, but it really is an advantage um, to growing salad because the soil holds that moisture. So when there's a drought, you don't have to water as much and it holds its moisture nicely and it's easier to direct water away that way. So we're planning to do a bunch of earthworks this year to direct the water where we want it to go to put in some more ponds and Greg wants to do catfish out there so he can actually catch something when he goes fishing. <laughs> um, and so we can, it can, we can manage the fertility. We can, we learn, like I said, we learned a lot from our uh, Korean farmer friends and grouping out the muck from the bottom of the pond and putting that back on the roads and stuff like that. But it does take a long time to get the soil conditioned enough to where there's actually some topsoil because right now it's like light brown clay and then underneath it is gray clay. It's like, where's the topsoil? So building up the topsoil is taking us a long time, especially because it's just the two of us. This year we have an intern coming that we think will, you know, be able to be our farm manager. She's got a uh, lot of experience working on the farms and stuff like that so that we can, because we have the farm. So we, we, we realized we needed to get the farm in the city to the point where we had bled enough of the weeds out to where it would be, you know, systematic, rip out the rows, the plant with the compost, all that sort of stuff. So it would be easy and to have things set up, have our market set up because uh, we're launching new things. We're always launching new things. We'll be able to get it to the point where someone else could run the stuff for us and we could spend sort of, half our time in the country and then half our time in the city. And it's just this, I mean, it's just this, this, get away from the city. It's, it, the city is intense. Like I said before, it's nice to be out in the country, even though there's ticks out there. Right. <laughs> so like, I remember when we first got out there, I was like, we were like, what the heck? Oh my God, it's ticks. And every year when I have my spring tick nightmare, then I'm okay to deal with them for that year. But every year I got to have my little tick nightmare. Wait a minute, cold sweat. And I'm like, okay, I think I can, I think I can deal with it. <laughs> for me, it's for real asking, if you ever see them in the grass waiting with their arms out reach, like, come on, walk past, walk past. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. It's like, oh, get off me, get off me. Sorry. Are you guys eventually planning to move the farm out to the country or is is brother nature produce going to be a split operation in the future we thought about it a lot and i think will be a split operation because the idea in life really is to have as many options as possible it is easier to farm on the country because people are also farming on the country but there's not as many markets like where we're going to sell to because we specialize in salad and a lot of there's not as many restaurants and things out there. And the ones that are, a lot of them seem to be happy to just get their produce as cheap as possible from Cisco or whoever. So if we moved out to the country, you know, we would be still coming down here constantly to sell stuff. So it doesn't make sense to move out there. But it doesn't make sense to give up out in the country either because it has its advantages. In fact, it's 10 degrees cooler up there. So in the spring, when the salad starts to bolt up here, the salad up there is just now getting big enough. You give the rows down here a chance to have a break and you can tarp them or mulch them or let the chickens have their way with them for a while. And so um, and we're not the only farmers in Detroit who are doing the split farm thing. Our friends who love your show, Andy and Amy of Fisheye Farm, they have a place outside the city too. So I think more people will be doing that. It certainly seems like something that makes sense. And especially when you talk about this idea of diversification of, you know, it's diversification of enterprises, diversification of landscapes, that that really does give you some strength and some resilience. 
especially out in the country. Also, it's flat. You know, it's really flat <laughs> in Michigan anyway. It probably is in Wisconsin. Flat out in the country. And so with the weather becoming more destabilized and having more wind storms and more tornadoes and they're being stronger and bigger than they were before, the country is vulnerable to that more than the city. So that's another advantage of having both places, but the logistics. That's when you have to learn your time management uh, style and really be on top of things and be organized and keep to your schedule and stuff like that. Because if you forget a tool or something in Detroit and you're halfway to Riley, uh, I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> you don't turn around and go back like you wasted the day. So it requires being more organized to have two different places. Olivia, with that, we're going to stop here, take a quick break, get a word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Olivia Hubert from Brother Nature Produce in Detroit, Michigan. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes, and streamlining order management. Farmer's Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online and also those that order by phone or email. Use Farmer's Web to generate a product catalog for buyers, allow buyers to review your real-time availability online, and create harvest lists and packing slips for your orders. Farmer's Web helps you inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and more, while helping you keep track of special pricing and customer information. You can also download detailed financial reports. Farmer's Web offers a free account type and a flat monthly fee on paid plans. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types at any time. Check out a demo video and Farmer's Web Guide to Working with Wholesale Buyers at FarmersWeb.com. Perennial support for the podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. What if you didn't have to worry about weak transplants and poor germination due to less than great potting soil, or getting truly finished compost for your homemade blend, or making sure that your employees remember to add the fertilizer charge? What if you could grow plants up until the roots filled the container without having to worry about supplying extra fertility? What if your potting soil had your back consistently, year after year after year? That's what Vermont Compost Potting Soil can bring to you. I used Vermont Compost Fort B as a blocking mix and potting soil for 12 years on my farm. We grew great transplants with it. I mean really great transplants year after year after year. Without worry and with the confidence that I was truly setting my plants up for success. In something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something you can count on. VermontCompost.com All right, and we're back with Olivia Hubert from Brother Nature Produce in Detroit, Michigan. Olivia, you mentioned your friends in Korea and some of the research that you've done about growing brassicas better. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you've made those connections and what you've learned? Yeah, one of the interesting things also about farming in the city is there's a strong activist community in Detroit. And I know a, a lot of farmers who are in more rural places see the news about the activists and they're crazy and they just want to destroy everything. But really, it's just another kind of community. So we have lots of friends in the activist community who are fighting for environmental justice and, and all sorts of things like that. And one of those ladies does yoga. I think Iyengar, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Yoga, um, she's Korean. Um, Gui Sok, a.k.a. Peggy, everybody knows her. She's a, as they say, she's a badass yoga nun. And then she'll be posed looking all serene and, um, and cute. She goes back to Korea places. And we, we're going to ask her to find us some Korean farmers to be friends with who can answer our questions because, it was a really bad, bad flea beetle year. You know, when it doesn't get that cold, the flea beetle, you know, they'll come out. It's supposed to be that they come out when there's, you know, a week of consecutive, you know, a consecutive week of 50 degree temperatures or and above or something. But sometimes if it hasn't been that cold, they'll come out sooner. So we had a really bad flea beetle year. And they were a lot of people just stopped with the grass because in the spring, a lot of other uh, urban farmers and gardeners in the city, just they just gave up on brassicas in the spring because it was it was so bad. But we're like, you know, my husband, he's like, yeah, rah, rah, come on, let's figure it out. So she connected us with some farmers. I don't even know their names, but that's that's we talked through. We saw and she gave me a long list of stuff that we should be doing. 
strategies to deal with the flea beaters because, of course, a lot of the vegetables that Korean people and a lot of other Asian people eat are basically just brassicas, you know, different kinds of mizunas, broccoli relatives with long names, and all different Asian people call the same thing, something different. And the the main thing they said, which really struck me, was that you're going to have to expect some flea beetle damage. Like, it, after a while, yes, you can grow your brassicas and under the row cover, but if you leave that row cover off in the late spring one time, or the wind blows it off or whatever, and they get in the soil, they're in there. And once they're in there, and sometimes if they're under the road cover and you don't know it, they will be living it up in flea beetle heaven unbeknownst to you. So except that there's going to be some flea beetle damage. And then they, another thing that they recommended was tobacco, was tobacco, which we didn't try this, was tobacco. that they Apparently they don't like to sell tobacco. So planting things in the tobacco family around your brassicas, around the edge of your farm. And then other strategies that you have that you, people are probably already familiar with, like trap crops, like plant some brassicas someplace away from your main crop and don't do anything to it. Because a lot of flea come out of bushes and hedgerows. So plant it on the edge of the bushes so that they don't bother to come out. And of course, there's row cover. And that seems to be the best strategy. But like I said, if you ever have a mishap with the real cover and they get in there, then they're in there. And then there's also crop rotation period where if you can have another farm, stay out in the country, um, where you haven't been growing that many brassicas. But even out in the country, we do have some flea beetles. But we also find that if we can get the salad to grow faster than the flea beetles bite it, then they will outgrow the flea bite. So getting, making the soil, making sure the soil is, a really nice tilt and it's easy for the roots to get down there. And then there's, there's plenty of nutritious compost for the plants to, to suck up so that they can grow fast. Because sometimes you'll see in the spring, if it's, if it's a cold snap or something, the plants will kind of like stop and they'll be in suspended anime. And that's when the flea beetle really go in like, yeah, y'all, bam, bam, bam. So try to keep the plants growing. But then I have another strategy, and this is the first time I'm sharing this with the public. All right. <laughs> I was going to laugh at me when he hears this later. I was looking in some old-timey book about, like, hopper dozers, grass. That's like a hopper dozer. That's a real old-timey for grasshoppers. It's basically a trap to, to get grasshoppers because we also have grasshopper problems in the summertime in the little and they're big, it's easier to do, but when they're little, they're, they're hard to catch or do something with. And they were talking about tanglefoot, which is that's something that mainly people who have orchards buy tanglefoot. And, and they either buy the, the paper with the tanglefoot already on it, or they'll buy some paper and put the tanglefoot on it. And I was noticing that the flea beetle were really active in the middle of the day. They would hop. We would be out there harvesting when the sun started to get high. And they would actually jump on my hand. And I was, you know, how dare you touch me? You're eating my salad. And then you had the nerve to jump on me. So I, I noticed that they were active during the day. And I noticed that when they first bred, they would be the flea beetles when they first hatched, they would be the size of dust in that first stage. You know, when they, when they after they get finished pupating, because they have a really interesting life cycle. Kind of like fleas have an interesting life cycle and ticks have an interesting life cycle. But anyway, um, they would be really tiny, like dust, and there would be a cloud of dust, and they would be hopping around and stuff like that. So I decided to get some paper, like some some thick paper. I just found some, like a roll of paper. It's got to be fairly thick, otherwise it'll rip when you're painting the tangle foot on there. You get your brush that's dedicated to the tangle foot container only, because you don't want to get rocks and stuff in the tangle foot. Otherwise, it'll rip the paper when you paint it on there, and it'll just it'll just make it messy. And then if you get rocks in there, you won't be able to tell if you caught flea beetle or not because they're going to be the size of teeny tiny pebbles. So you paint a strip on the bottom. You leave an inch unpainted because that bottom, that bottom inch of the paper, you're going to brush directly over the tops of the leaves of the plant. And then you paint a like three inch wide band above the empty strip. And then on the back, you paint from directly starting at the bottom of the paper you paint another two inch wide strip across the paper and the paper should be as wide as your average row. Most people who are farming are very particular about the size of their rows. 
And our roles are not all the same size because Greg made them before I came along and made him make things <laughs> uniform. <laughs> so there's, <laughs> they're slowly becoming more uniform, but, and you take that and you take a bamboo cane or something to wrap around the top of the paper so that you can hold Cause you have to be able to do this by yourself because if you need someone else to hold the side of the paper, you're not going to do it as often as you need to do it. Cause you need to do it when the sweet beetle first start coming out, you need to do it. I would say every day and people are like, oh, I don't have that kind of time, but it's not going to take that long. And it's worth it because if you can get the newborn flea beetle that, you know, the first generation of that year from the parents that overwinter, then you can drastically cut down on your flea beetle damage. You've got to get that first generation. If you let that first generation go, I don't know what you're going to do. You got to catch them as soon as possible. So in the midst of all your other stuff, and this is something that a kid can do too. So for people who have older kids and they want to help out on the farm or they need to help out on the farm, this is something that they can do. And it'll be interesting to them because after you swipe across the row, and I have all different kinds of techniques. I won't go into the really boring details of you got to swipe, you know, it's almost like curling or uh, like the Zamboni <laughs> guy like has their technique. You got to swerve this way and then go back the other. I'm not going to get into all those details, but you drag it gently over the tops of the, of the brassicas and it disturbs the plants and they jump up on the paper. And then it gives you so much satisfaction to see them like sticky on the paper, like ah, sticky on the paper. And then it lets you count them. So then you can see how many you're catching, how big they are. And then sometimes you'll see that you have different kinds of flea beetles and you'll catch other insects too. Like we had this weird moth problem. I could never figure out the name of the moth, but it was, that would be in a salad. And we couldn't quite figure out, it wasn't the big cabbage white moth. It was a small brown moth and it was kind of short. We couldn't tell if it was, it was a pest. We knew it was a pest, but we couldn't quite figure it out. But they also fly up on the paper. And that works good, too, for the dreaded leaf miner adults that it'll work on them at night. That's my second strategy, because the leaf miners are a problem for brassicas, too, but it's hard to get them because they jump, they hop, they have a hard body. The adult leaf miners, because the leaf miners, of course, is just the larva. And they are attracted to light at night. So I have one of those solar lanterns, and I would make a paper cuff to go around the lantern. Or I would use a solar lantern, because if you use a real lantern with fire, you're gonna, it's going to catch on fire. Don't do that. Don't catch your farm on fire at night when you can't see. Don't do that. So get your solar lantern and make a paper cuff and then paint the tangle foot on that and then turn the light on. And especially if out in the country or if there's no full moon and there's no, you know, no other light to distract the insects, hold. And I, this is what I really, this is what I really getting in touch with my, my wannabe Korean side. Um, put a, you know, attach a pole, put it of the, put the lantern on the end of a cane with a hook or something. Cause you want to be able to hold it low without bending over. Cause you got to save your back for all that farm work. And you hover that over the salad. They're attracted to the light. And when they jump up towards the light, they get stuck on the paper. And it's got all the same advantages as for the flea beetle. And you can get other insects that hang around at night, too. And while you're going out there with the light, you can see if you have slugs, which is another brassical problem, especially if you're having to irrigate a lot or if it's been a particularly wet year. So it does so many things. And so it's worth it. But people still be, you know, I'm sure people still be like, oh, she's crazy. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not about to go out there with lanterns and sticks and sticky paper. But it's worth it. Even if you're just at the beginning of the season, just to get yourself off to a good start. Because if you don't make that money in the spring, that, you know, it sets the tone for the rest of the year. Well, and <laughs> showing up to market with flea beetle free crops in the spring sets right. people up to, to go, oh, yeah, this is. This is the high value producer. These are the, you know, because people don't like e even this, no matter how hard you try to convince them that the holy arugula is okay, they don't like it. Right. Right. A few bites and they're okay. Because we, like I like, um, like we were told, you're always going to have a few here and there. And the bigger, a bigger bite here and there is okay. But there's little teeny tiny, looks like something they've been shot with a teeny tiny shotgun or like, you know, <laughs> buckshot. We say that's our signature bug bites. That's what we say, the rattlesnake coil, <laughs> which is a fancy restaurant. We're like, oh, that's just our signature bug bite. <laughs> they, they go for it. They go for it as long as it's not too many. 
And of course, my husband's dimple helps. It helps. <laughs> I, I think dimples are probably a, a really good marketing tool. They are. <laughs> now, you mentioned that along with your salad mix production, of course, it's a high input production system. It needs a lot of fertility added into the system. And you yeah. talked about Greg's, and I'm, and I'm putting, I'm going to say Greg's in finger, with finger <laughs> quotes here, but Greg's compost operation. His obsession, yeah. He helped to start a company called Detroit Dirt, but it got to be too much. And so he was taken away from the farm too much. So he stopped doing that. But now he's got up with another guy. I forget the name of the company, but Tim, shout out to Tim, um, a young man who uh, he collects compost from, I guess, like into the restaurants and institutions. He might do some hospitals, I think. And we get the scraps, and that leads to. Yeah, another thing. So we get the scraps and our neighbors who have birds, who have ducks, come and get some of the scraps and the other scraps go in the compost pile. And we get leaves from our landscaper friends and we get wood chips from our tree surgeon friends. And then we get brew grain from the local microbrewery and mix that all together and make compost. That's one of the things, one of his passions is making compost because we realize which is a a disadvantage of having a super small farm, you know, the super small farm, even our farm in the the country is only, is only six acres. And part of that is the creek. So obviously we're not about to farm. I mean, I guess we could farm in the creek. We still don't have that much land to farm. So that means you have to maximize every square inch. And it's hard to do a crop rotation because you literally can't afford to take that row out of production. So the way around that is to keep the soil fertility high by constantly top dressing, adding compost, and to try not to till as much as possible. And that, that's where the chickens come in and that's where tarps come in. But even then, you still can't, you know, take out half your rows and put it under tarp because you need it for production. So that's why we're so obsessed with making compost and, and top dressing. So tell me about how your your salad mix production actually works at a nuts and bolts level. I mean, you mentioned the tarps, you mentioned pulling plants out. Are you guys set up on a bed system or or are you doing individual rows or solid seating or just kind of dig into that for me a bit? Yeah, we have rows. I think we have about 30 rows and most of them run east, west. It's It's kind of hard to worry. But then we have some north, south rows. Um, that are in a little microclimate between some trees. Um, and that's built for in the summertime. So we got about 30 something rows. We have two hoop houses. One of our hoop houses got a tree fell on it. So we have to fix it and plastic. And the other one collapsed under the snow. So we really don't have anything in our hoop houses. But we do have hoop houses and we usually have stuff in there. So we have the beds and the beds are built up two feet above level. So two feet, you can see where the sidewalk is. So the rows go up to the sidewalk and the soil's built up two feet. Uh, we we got the soil tested when we first started farming to make sure the lead level wasn't too high, which is very important and something that I think even people in the country should do because it's not like there was some kind of <laughs> sanction on leaded gas. And it's not like people in the country weren't also tinkering with cars and and they're, you know, in their fields and stuff and leaving things to rot. And I think everybody should just have the soil tested for heavy metals because we just live in a toxic world. That's just the way things are. So we made sure that the lead levels and the heavy metal levels were not high. And they weren't because it was houses there. Uh, but we put down a barrier of cardboard and wood chips and built the soil up over that over time. We have a six row cedar. That's the way we plant most of our salad because most of our salad up. Uh, our Asian greens, we put about Sometimes we have 12 different things in the salad mix and it changes with the season and our customers like that and they just accept that <laughs> that is going to be good. I'm in charge of quality control and making sure that the salad has the right balance of flavors because, I mean, it's no secret. If, you, if you're a real farmer, you look at our salad mix, you can tell what's in there. We have sorrel, uh, French, whatever French uh, sorrel in there for the lemony flavor and then we have the brassicas for the sometimes bitter, sometimes spicy flavor. And then we'll do bland stuff, lettuces, and then things that just taste sweet and clean, like Tokyo Bacana, you know, the Chinese 
cabbage, although <laughs> other people who aren't Chinese, they'd be like, that's not Chinese. <laughs> they get mad. And then we we also put other things in there, like purslane. That's a nice you know, one to give you that juicy flavor in the summertime. Grows well in the summertime and, and you know, just gives you that, you know, full flavor, nice texture. So we put lots of different stuff in our salad mix and it changes based on, on the temperature. And, we you know, of course, the salad changes throughout the season, too, based on the age of the salad. The older you get, the spicier you get. And that's one of my jokes with some of uh, my middle-aged women customers. They're some of our happiest customers, the older ladies. Um, they ask about the salad. And, and they like, oh, is it spicy? I said, well, you know, the older it gets, the spicier it gets, and then I give them a nudge, nudge, and then that makes them <laughs> laugh. <laughs> and they feel good about themselves and have a chuckle. Uh, because it's true. So it's like, it's true, girl. Yeah. So we have a giggle at the market. So the salad, so we're constantly ripping out salad and replanting because you don't want to let the salad start to bulk. You want to get to it before that. But it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance because you want to get as many cuts because we, you know, we cut it. We don't cut it all the way down to the ground. We cut it so that it'll grow back. We also use one of those uh, salad harvesting machines, you know, the one that's with a drill. Greg is a machine person, not me. <laughs> but the, with the drill and it's got the, the blades that go back and forth. Uh, we use that. The one from Farmer's Friend. So we use that to harvest, and we also do harvest some things by hand because some things it just is just too rough on. How many times when you talk about cutting high so that you can come back and harvest again? How many times are you harvesting a typical patch? It depends on the year. I mean, one year we had a really good year with uh, it was warm but not too cold, and moist but not too wet, and we got 23 cuttings out of some rows, but usually we get, I would say we get, I think we get about seven, wow. seven cuttings. I think it's a good number because we're constantly top dressing. And we also weed. I know a lot of farmers um, don't take time to weed. They just rip the whole row out. When you do that, it's going to take, you know, it's going to take 20 something days to get that salad to be big enough to cut even as baby. So when you rip that out, can you afford to rip it out? So sometimes it's worth it um, if the salad's looking good, it's growing well to just do some weeding. And that's also where top dressing comes in because that helps keep the weed seeds covered up. Ideally, and what we're working towards is bleeding enough weeds out of the soil that we can just let the salad reseed itself, go to seed in that row, and then just keep going like that. But that's, that's going to take some time. Are you using other sources of fertility with the salad mix beyond just the compost? Yeah, we do. Uh, we'll do foliar feeds from seaweed. We'll get the, uh, yeah, the seaweed and do foliar feeds with that. And we do compost feed, but we usually, we usually do that in between cutting. So we're not going to do that and then go and harvest the salad. We're not trying to make anybody sick, but... We'll, we'll do uh, foliar seeds. And then when you talk about doing the, the weed control, is that all just done by hand? Uh, it's, mostly, it's mostly done by hand. And that's also a benefit of ripping the rows out is then you rip the weeds out too. So we weed by hand. and we're really fast at weeding. And it's about getting to the weeds before they get too big. And it depends on what kind of weed. Like when you're dealing with thistle, that... Some, uh, that's a, most of the reason why we plow is because the thistle is just, and so we say, oh, don't plow, just pull it out. But uh, sometimes it's just that bad. But for other things like buying weed, you know, oh boy, buying weed. Yeah, for buying weed or for chickweed and hen dip, those things that come in the spring, if you can get them before they sprawl out, it doesn't take that long. You spend, and it also gives you a chance to, to talk. Again, <laughs> looking for chances to talk. While you're weeding, you know, Greg will be on one side of the row and I'll be on the other and we'll be weeding. And sometimes it gets a little competitive, but most of the time we're just weeding and talking. And our daughter, even though she's four, she knows about weeds too. So she helps a little bit. (laughs) Farm kids know about weeds. Yeah. Yeah. She helps a little bit. Um, It's worth it to us if we can keep the row the road going if it's not starting to bolt. If it's starting to bolt, then a lot of times we'll just we'll just rip the whole row out. But we're hoping to employ a chicken tractor type thing. I got three bantam hens. <laughs> I got three little bantam hens 
and a mobile coop, and we're hoping to roll that out over the road. And instead of ripping them out ourselves, put the hands on it and then let them do the ripping and the tilling and the pooping in the row and just move them several times in the day. I'm sure the three of them will do one row, at least one row in a day, sometimes more than that. So we're hoping to employ the chickens to help too. Ideally, we would be able to just cut the salad back hard and then tarp it and let it, you know, the the salad, you know, decompose into the top layer and then top dress and put some more seeds on top of that. But uh, taking land out of production, that would take a while. Mm. Now, and that's interesting to me that you guys, from what you're describing, you've been in more or less continual production in most of these beds for, you know, for, for six, seven, eight years where, yep. where you're not I mean, it's a small plot, so crop rotation isn't even really all that effective in a small space. And then you're, right. you're adding the fact that you're just you're you're growing and growing and growing and not even taking time to do things like the tarping because you want to get stuff back into production right away. Have you noticed right. a change or any kind of an impact on the soil quality over the years? Yeah, our our soil quality is actually. It sounds it's funny, but it's actually improved over the years because we did have a time there after when we first started that we weren't so obsessed with making compost that we did have a problem with soil fertility, but it has improved. But I laugh because Detroit, Detroit when they say the studies talk about how most American cities are sitting on the, most, the prime, the best, the top soil or the best soil. America is so true. We had to dig down to redo our sewer line. And it was, I had never seen soil. So it was just black. It was a perfect texture. I'm like, what in the world? Like, let's move our house and farm this. But, you know, it's too late to do that. But the soil was already pretty good. But the soil, the soil tilt has improved and its fertility has improved, but only because we're constantly adding more compost and doing stuff to it. We've also bled more weeds out. It's just a different strategy. Like uh, for, I think, crop rotation, if we had more land, we would definitely do it. But since we don't, then adding the the fertility ourselves has been our strategy. What are you using for fertility operations? Is, do the tractors actually fit in there or do you have other tools that you're using for that? Uh, yeah, we have a compact tractor, and it's it's funny because our land in the country, we need a full size tractor, and so we kind of go back and forth about that. I'm like, you're gonna, you know, because he, you, you, if you overwork the compact tractor, you just tear it up. So we have three farm mechanics, we have two in the city, and one out in the country just to keep the tractor and the <laughs> truck going because we need the bigger size vehicle, but. The bigger size vehicle means you need an equipment trailer, means you need, you know, a bigger truck, a bigger this, a bigger that. And my husband's reluctant to go to the bigger size. So, so he just keep tearing that little tractor up out there, poor thing. Yeah, we have a compact tractor that sits over the road. And like I said before, he should have been a fighter pilot, the way he maneuvers that thing. And we do have a small little walk behind tiller, but we're always letting people borrow it and we don't really know where it is right now. But <laughs> if we, if we do use it where we know where it is. We do a lot of stuff by hand. We call it, my husband calls it farm yoga. A lot of our friends uh, teach yoga and, uh, and meditation and stuff. And um, we have a lot of massage therapist friends. They put us back together and um, help us keep going because, of course, the salad, you know. <laughs> It's so close to the ground, and you do have to get down there sometimes. So he called this farm yoga, stretching over the roads and harvesting or weeding and then going down on the other leg and, and all this other stuff. We we probably do a video about it on our website sometime to explain all the stuff we, we're doing out there to stay fit and and to make our work as much as, as possible something that will benefit us instead of thinking about the times when we have to harvest the salad by hands with a knife or scissors as, oh no, my back. Start thinking of it as an opportunity to, to stretch yourself, stretch out, and it, it can be a benefit to you. It doesn't have to be um, something horrible 
you know, that you don't want to do, it could be, you know, it could be a benefit. Tell me about the harvesting and post-harvest handling with the salad mix. You're using the, the spinny harvester with the oscillating blades on it yeah. to do a lot of the harvest. And then sometimes you're out there with knives. But yep. once you get the crop picked, what happens next since you aren't doing refrigeration? Right. So we have a, a salad washing station. We have a really big three-basin sink. Also, one of the benefits of being in the city is that restaurants come and go and they upgrade their equipment and they're like, oh, I don't want this, you know, $2,000 sink anymore. Just come and get it. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we go over there and get it. So we have a really nice three-basin sink. And we'll dump the salad from the, the basket of the harvester machine into a tub, just like a Rubbermaid tub, the ones that are always on sale at this time of year, and unwashed. And then if it's really hot outside, we'll have ice in there. If it's not, because we try to harvest before it gets hot outside, of course. After it gets hot outside, there's, you know, mm-mm, that's not going to work. If we do have to harvest when it's hot outside, we'll water the salad first. That way, We've got some water in it and it can hold up better to being cut. So anyway, we harvest it, we put it in the tub and we take it back to the backyard where we have the washing station and there's cold water in there. Now, of course, and I just went through this because we're going to be selling salads to go. So shout out to <laughs> Rick Sharon. <laughs> Not a Vulcan and inspector for Michigan Department of Agriculture who helped us get our license for the salads to go. Um, anyway, I'm mentioning him because I went through with him to make sure if he thought I was doing enough stuff, like am I being sanitary enough and stuff like that. And we went over things like that. We're not GAP certified, but I feel like what Rick says is good enough. So we were clean. We cleaned the, the tubs and everything beforehand, the scissors and everything. We want to be extra clean because unlike a bigger farm, if we have a, a health care, we, we probably wouldn't recover from it. We can't just be like, you know, change the name of our farm and just bounce back like, oh, hell, you know, right. if something happens, if somebody gets sick. Although we do have marketing insurance, but still, that's not the point. You don't want to make people sick. Uh, yes, everything has been clean and the proper bleach water solution, all the, the salad washing sinks and the, the knives, the scissors. Well, I'm the only one that harvests with a knife. He just uses scissors because everybody else is too clumsy. Greg is, Greg is too clumsy. Otherwise, they would have to wear a glove because people cut themselves. <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot with the with those knives because they're small and sharp. Then after that, we have we have bags. We get those Uline gel bags because they keep things nice and cold. The gel bags and they lay flat which is what I really like because then it doesn't take up as much space in the tubs. We put those in the bottom of the tubs and we put the salad. Okay, we have that ready. We put the salad in the water. We let it, I like to let it free float uh, because it lets rocks or any bugs crawl. It lets rocks fall to the bottom or any insects crawl out of the salad. Sometimes when you just dip it and pull it out, that doesn't give them enough time. And you don't want to be opening up, you know, your salad tub and all these critters start flying out at the market or where at a restaurant. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> They're looking at you like, oh, boy. Generally um, not appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not really feeling that. <laughs> Although it has happened to us before. But again, the dimple. Uh, and we put it in the tubs and we leave it. Uh, the salad, we free float it and we scoop it out with a basket. We usually scoop it out with a basket or by hand. Some people will let the water out. I think that's a waste of water, although the water does go to our little duck pond, so that makes them happy. And then we just keep the salad in the shade. And then we keep the salad in the shade and somewhere along the line while we're harvesting, one of us stops harvesting and deliver salad to restaurants. So this is our big, I'll, this will be on our big harvest day on Friday. And we take it to restaurants and then we're having the salad for the Easter market. We do other markets too, like the Wednesday market, but yeah, for the, for our big market day. And we leave it in the shade. It's in the shade all day. It's said was built specifically for this. And there's a, the shed is open. So there's a, usually a nice breeze under there and it keeps the salad cold. We monitor the temperature of the salad with thermometers. If it is going to be warm, we will put the salad in the basement. Our basement is cold all year round. 
with the ice, and that's actually enough to keep it cold. It maybe it doesn't seem like that, but the deep old basement and uh, on the north side of the basement. And you're really talking about keeping it for a, a very short period of time. It's not like you're trying to store right. it for days. Right. The salad is, is going out that same day or the next morning. And so we the salad that we the salad that we harvest that day is sold by noon on Saturday. And so Greg will come back to the farm and harvest more salad for the later part of the market day. So he'll get me set up at the market with the salad from the night before and then he'll go home and harvest more salad. And that's the salad that we'll sell after noon until we leave, until we sell out to make sure that it that is fresh. So that's how we do that. <laughs> wow. So I mean that's that's no joke about about fresh and and really not having any time between the harvest and, and when the product's sold. Right. And this it makes so much difference. So that's one of the complaints people have about salad. They will eat more salad and they will eat healthy except when they buy the salad, it rots immediately. And I'm like, yeah, that's because the salad that you're buying is actually not fresh. Yes, it's refrigerated immediately, but refrigerated immediately a week ago, two weeks ago, this is less than 12 hours old. And it lasts people so much longer and gives them the confidence to really step out there on that limb into the, the land of vegetables. Because a lot of people don't do vegetables just because they don't know how to take care of them. And it's really disheartening when they buy something and it just rots on them. It makes them not want to try things again, and it makes them kind of, you know, makes them pull back. And the restaurants really love it, even though they, <laughs> the salad never hangs around in the restaurants for very long. Our salad lasts seven to ten days in the refrigerator because it's so fresh. And we do all this stuff around making sure that the water we wash the salad in is 40 degrees to bring it down to temperature right away. And, you know, putting it in ice in between the field and the washing and then putting it in ice again and storing it in a cool, breezy place. So, yeah, those are our main strategies for our post-harvest handling. So even though you're farming without refrigeration, you're not farming without cooling. Right. You, you got to do that because you'll open the tub and it'll be like, oh, that smell, that heat. <laughs> Ooh, it's just starting to rot already. You're like, no. Yeah. Olivia, with that, I think this is a good spot for us to stop, get one more word from one more sponsor, and then we're going to come back and do our lightning round. This lightning round is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and across the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, that BCS tackled jobs that we simply couldn't do with a larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments plus videos of BCS in action. Olivia, what's your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool is a hoe. And I'm cracking up because <laughs> Greg is teasing me. He's like, oh, that's what happens when you let her listen to the Carolina chocolate drops and she's listening to those Negro spirituals. She wants to be out there with a hoe. <laughs> uh, but I really do like it for its versatility. And I'm kind of it's kind of cool. Like if I see a mouse out there or something, if Greg is not around, and I like get it with the hoe, and then I can move stuff with the hoe, and I I really like the hoe for some reason. <laughs> and is there is there a particular <laughs> hoe that you like, a particular style of hoe, or something in particular that you're looking for in a hoe? Yeah, I'm looking for a a hoe with a lightweight handle. Um, that way, when you're lifting, you're lifting the weight of the hoe and not just the handle. Um, so. And one of those regular square edge holes, but not a big square, because you don't want to take, a, when you're using it, you don't want to, you know, slice a big chunk of soil. You just want to slice a small chunk, because then you can go longer with the hole than if you have a big heavy hole or one that's really wide. And if you really love a hole, how do you keep your hole sharp? <laughs> Oh, uh, we have all these files. We have a bench grinder, and I'm always down there where Greg is uh, grinding the edge with that. And then we have files and wet stone. What's your favorite crop to grow? I mean, out of all of the things that you're doing yes. for the salad, if you had to stick with just one, what would it be? 
actually the salad <laughs> actually the salad kind of gets on my nerves because it's so needy my <laughs> husband really he decided to grow salad for the reasons you know good reasons and I don't want to change from salad because uh, we are successful with the salad and um but I really like to grow uh I like to grow fresh fresh beans so uh, Crowder peas, I just said beans, but Crowder peas, which I guess technically, I don't know, some people get into it, and then especially down south, they get mad, like, it's a bean, no, it's a pea, no, you know, um, yeah, Crowder peas, that's my favorite, because it, they're delicious, I think that's why, because I like to eat them, and also for the biodiversity of, of insects, all these different boss and native bees and things that um, drink the nectar from the flowers uh, during, you know, you know, as the in the beginning, well, really throughout the whole season, they and it's interesting, especially for um, doing things with children and keeping children interested in farming and getting them into nature. Going out there with a magnifying glass and a nice insect book, or even going out there and taking a picture of it and then looking it up on Google or whatever. Um, they just offer so much. I really like growing crowded bees. That's my favorite thing to grow. And is that a crop that you guys take to market? Or is that just something that, that is strictly for the family? It's just for the family. And I use it uh, to bribe to bribe my neighbors. Nice. Nice. To All keep right. them sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Olivia, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? If I could tell my beginner farmer self one thing, I would say... Uh, hold, I would just say hold on to the knowledge that you've gained so far, like just because you're not able to implement some of the things and put some of the systems in place and organization and things that you want doesn't mean that you'll never be able to do them. Just stick with them. Keep, keep trying. And eventually, you know, you'll be able to do them. Olivia, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. You're welcome. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 165 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for the show at Farmer to Farmer dot com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Hubert. That's H-U-B-E-R-T. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit OsborneSeed.com for high quality seed industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. And you can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your email inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>